It's amazing how much of, of a performance is mental. Now, I am going to switch gear a little bit and add, ask you something a little bit more personal as a musician. Okay. Um, in my reading about you and your work, you, you talk about being authentic with your music and, and you really value collaboration. Mm -hmm. Tell us about how collaboration have enriched you as a musician and, and why is that so important for you? Yeah, so collaboration, I think, is a really interesting term and in, in, in how you actually define it and to me the definition of collaboration is always that the end result is something that you wouldn't have been able to get to without that collaboration yeah. happening so so it's very different from simply um working together with somebody it's mm -hmm. something where really there are two equal voices or, or more than that equal voices who all have input on every step of the, of the process. Um, so for me, I think it's so exciting precisely because of that. It's allowed me to get to places as a musician that I think I never would have got to without those things happening. It's allowed me to um, take knowledge from other people and to give my knowledge back to them. And I think it's, I mean, all music really is essentially a conversation. It's all about communication and collaboration really feels like the ultimate form of, of that communication between people. Is there a collaborative project <laughs> that means a lot for you that, um, that you, you, you were just so happy to be a part of? I mean, there's there's lots. One of my favorite projects that I have done in my time was a project called The Secret North, which was with musicians from Scotland and Ireland and Scandinavia. And we came together and did like a week long creative residency up in the Highlands of Scotland, where we also Sounds shared fun. our music and wrote music for each other and then went on tour with that. That's definitely been one of the most rewarding things that I've done. But I think any time I've got to share um, my culture with somebody from another culture has been so rewarding. Like it's amazing how it's, it's especially interesting if you don't speak each other's language very well, how much you can still communicate just with music is it's really remarkable. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. And there's also um, there's also uh, projects like traditional spirits, which are, are more of a what I would as an as a normal sort of audience can look at it as just you know a band but it is a collaboration on on its own because you know you you are bringing in musicians to work on your music and i imagine there's a lot that goes behind the scene in terms of building that relationship and collaborating to make the project happen before we even see the song on yeah, a record definitely there's a huge i mean with my my main project is a band called the outside track and yes, that come across um, them too that's been going for oh, 15 years now, I think. And yeah, I mean, that's like having, it's like a relationship, you know, it, we all know each other inside out and you're, every time you get together to rehearse, you're not only bringing your music, but your personalities to the table and all the driving forces of, of what excites you musically. And yeah, it, it's always a really interesting um, experience to, to compose or arrange music with other people. Um, Cause there's so many forces that can come into into play there and so many things can dictate the direction that something takes. How have that interactions changed since uh, COVID has uh, come into play? Some things have been easier and then other things have definitely been harder. I, I have found that the, um, to be truly creative with somebody online is very difficult. I think, I think it's very hard to actually like co-write music or because of the delay, you can't really play in the same way. But it, I have found it's been really good for sort of the planning stage of things. And there's, I, I think that probably everybody's found that, that it's been a good indicator of who are your, who are your true friends and what are your true interests and who are the people that you keep in touch with and what are the projects that you're excited by that you look forward now to, to doing. Um, so there's been an awful lot of planning has been going on at this stage and, and sort of um, developing relationships that hopefully for projects that will come into fruition after lockdown and things like that. Yeah, for sure. And on that note, when, when you're working with a team, and again, because I have a friend who, um, was in the music industry with a major label and and i really get to hear the story about what it takes to create something big 
and then you know like literally all we see is a cv at the end it's mm -hmm. almost like all the hard work that goes behind the scene is unnoticed um and and i have hear you talk about sort of you know wanting to maybe bring people to the attention behind sort of what it takes to create something awesome and 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 fantastic and be able to bring it to the audience have you think about how you might want to integrate some of that into sort of you know your, your future do you want to share more about that process with people so there's awareness um like what, what do you think about that yeah i, I definitely think I think it'd be great to have more transparency around what mm -hmm. what goes into um, a musician's life, essentially, for both for for audience and for people who think that that might be the type of life that they want to kind of give them a bit more of a guiding path along the way. Because yes, as you say, like especially at the moment, I feel like I'm a composer and arranger and performer and a web design person and a marketer and. A, <laughs> You know, one woman show and a graphic designer and all these, like a, a fine like an accountant like you have to have so many other skills mm -hmm. in order to make things happen if for when we're touring like there's so many logistics that go into it to planning right. your travel and your hotel and your timings of everything and yeah like there's i would say that when we're really on tour maybe 10 percent of our day is spent on music and the rest is spent on other things um so and that's a bit that i think people don't realize a lot about um being a musician that in some ways that's what i'm feeling so grateful to it during these COVID times that i in some ways i feel more like a musician in this time although i'm not playing to audiences but i am spending a lot more time overall on getting to play music but I'm not driving seven hours to the next gig or mm. doing sound checks and things like that yeah, I, I hope Hub Connections is going to be able to spotlight some of these things that are happening behind the scene for um, people like myself, who are typically the consumer of an end product. Um, and I really, um, it, it really struck me when I talked to people like Josh and, and get to really know about the amount of work that goes behind producing one little thing that he shared with us, even if it's as simple as a sheet music, right? Um, there's so much work that goes behind it. And I, I remember myself asking him, you have 29 hours a day? Because <laughs> I don't know how you fit all that in. So I, I think it's important to, to keep that conversation alive and, and mm -hmm. really getting people to understand, you know, it. being musician, I think a lot of times we think it's a very glamorous sort of uh, job, but there's a lot of hard work that go behind it. And, and I think those need to be uh, talked about and, and get uh, recognized. So thank you very much for doing what you do, because no, with our artists like yourself, we won't be able to enjoy beautiful music the same way. I don't think so, right? Um, and what other um, things come to your mind when, you, when you're when you're performing, when you're, you're when you're being sort of that authentic musician in, on the stage and and building that connection with the audience, what what are some other things that you might want us to know as the audience that maybe it's going in the back of your head but we never really think about? Um, what 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 is that performance experience? What is your mm -hmm. ideal performance experience as an audience? What should we be looking out for instead of just you know focusing on the harp, which is important, but there's so much more. What else would you like us to know? Yeah, I mean, oh, that's such a good question. I mean, the first thing I would say is it's one of the most interesting things about performing is how different it is every single night um, and also how different p different people's experience on the stage can be. Very often, like we come off with the band and I might say, oh, my God, that was a great concert. I loved it. And someone else is like, oh, no, that was a terrible <laughs> concert for me, like for whatever reason. And the, it, it's it's amazing how much of, of a performance is mental um, and anything can throw you off on stage. Sometimes it's like you can get very, um, if I ever get nervous, normally it's like I suddenly get very hyper aware of like, what do I do with my mouth when I play the harp? What, what am I meant to do? Or like something really stupid like that. And it can be enough just to like kind of trigger your thoughts to go somewhere else other than what on what you're playing. Because you're always trying to find this like, really nice balance where you're thinking about the music but you're not thinking about it too much because as we all know like if, if you're playing something fast and then your brain actually starts to think about what you're doing and it totally gets in the way then again it becomes hard so you're sort of trying to get in this very comfortable like autopilot zone I right. guess um but I think for me gen generally I can tell quite quickly how quickly I'm going to relax into a performance a lot of that depends on the audience and how warm 
they feel like how kind of how um I, I tend to talk quite a lot in my performances because I think storytelling is a big part of just the tradition as well. Sure, and I think sure. it's important. Um, so yeah, you sort of see, are they reacting warmly to what you're doing and, and you can tell when you have their attention or not. Um, so I suppose, I, I think, it, oh, I don't know. I, I would an audience member know what's going through my head. <laughs> I hope I, they would know if I wasn't like <laughs> enjoying it. But I, I, I like I like that the audience can interpret what you do in their own way too, and that's okay. I think to some yeah, extent definitely. that's part of the magic of being in a live performance, right? Because mm. like you said, we could be looking at you thinking, "Oh my gosh, this comes so naturally for you," and for all we know, uh, you could be on the stage thinking, "Oh my gosh, I might have played the wrong note," or you know, totally, this, is, yeah. "This is not my best night," and we won't notice. Um, yeah. I think that that's that is potentially one of the things I really miss about being in a live concert is that Definitely. sort of immediate feedback and and our own experience and what we take away mm -hmm. from the performance. And I'm looking and it's funny as well it because there might be there you know nobody's perfect. There's always going to be mistakes, but there's some nights where. I might make more mistakes than the night before, but overall I feel like it was a better performance because it was just all more in the zone for some reason or, or whatever. Right. Like it's can it can really be um yeah, just so different from night to night. And I think that's really that's what keeps it exciting all the time. And that's what keeps the adrenaline there all the time because you never quite know what's gonna happen until you get on stage. For sure. And one thing I hear in what you just said is that you can be performing, but it doesn't always have to be perfect. Would you, would you agree with that? Like it, you might hit the wrong note, but it can still be a good performance. Definitely. And I think that again, comes down to like, um, down to like the authenticity thing that we spoke about. I would rather see it. I mean, it's down to my preference. I would rather see a performer who I felt was taking risks and who was being authentic on stage right. than somebody who was like, absolutely flawless and not perfect but there was no emotion in it um, right. and you know everybody's different that's why music is subjective but mm -hmm. that's what i would be i would rather see a performance that really communicated in some way even if not a hundred percent of the notes were completely accurate right. then something that to me just sort of had no soul to it so in my conversation with Josh, he has mentioned that he would like to live with a piece of music to sort of experience it and, and, and just sort of build a relationship with it. Do you have a similar process with your music? Do you feel like it's constantly growing and changing as you spend more time with it? Definitely. I, you know, it's so interesting because I my first things first book that I, I just put out, I recorded that CD back in 2000. 10, I think 2008, maybe even. So it was actually amazing to revisit that CD. You know, I, I don't listen to my own music. I'm not going to sit and listen to my own CDs. So to then suddenly I, I had to, because I wanted to like transcribe it as accurately as possible. And seeing the evolution of some of those pieces was quite extraordinary, like quite how much they had changed over time without that being a deliberate process at all. Um, but I think that's, that's what's interesting to me about music is that it does evolve and, and each night you might just play something a little bit differently or you do right. in traditional music, you know, variation is such a big part of it. So you might do something different or my left hands are very rarely the same. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's really a nice thing to allow your music to evolve. And certainly if I'm going to record something, I like to have sat with it for about six, six months or so in performance before mm -hmm. I record it, just to let it go on that journey and to let it, to let me really feel in performance what works and what doesn't and what needs to change before kind of locking in something mm -hmm. onto a cd yeah i think that's what for me personally i i'm more into the the celtic music as opposed to mm -hmm. the classical because i feel like there's not a lot of room necessarily for interpretation in the classical world uh, but in celtic music i feel like it's a lot more expressions there's 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 that personal touch that you can add to it and it, yeah it, listening to the same uh piece of music being played by different people i get a different emotion out of it and and it's such a neat experience to be able to sort of add that personal element to to the absolutely music that we're playing um and even with my sheet music i would hope that people you know they they learn it from the sheet but then they put their own twist onto it or they add ornamentation that they like or whatever you know it, I think it, it becomes a it's something that you're passing on that's the whole point right. of is there a couple piece from your um 
collection that you want to highlight for us that might be good for practicing sort of that expressions and emotionality uh, in in heart playing? Are there are there a couple ones that you you want you might want to suggest to us that would be particularly good for that? Yeah, um, there's a slow air that's called the Sands of Hosta. Um, so that's yeah, if you want to practice like your your long lyrical phrasing then i would say that's a very good one um there's a tune in my little lights book called the old mate of galway and that's a it's a sort of slow reel but it's got a really um or it should have this really like groovy feel to it and it's a lot about kind of that left hand percussion so that that's maybe one where you look at it on the page and sort of think oh this this is just a straightforward reel but it's actually got a lot more of that that feel to it mm -hmm. um and then another one, Glimmer, that's another one that's, um, again, kind of looks very simple on the page, but it, but it is very, a sort of very emotional piece or, or was written to be a very emotional piece. So, yeah. Any tips on how to how to get connected to the music um, beyond just playing the right note? What what other suggestions would you have for us in, in, in connecting with the music? I think a big one is singing. Um, okay. And, you know, I am not a great singer at all, but I would always um, spend a lot of time just singing the melodies that I'm playing and really thinking like, think about how do I phrase it when I sing and where am I taking breaths and where do you sort of um, swoop down onto the notes and, and, and how, yeah, like I think it's a lot easier to to take it off the harp and, and imagine it in your head or, or through your voice. And then really you start to understand a piece of music better. So I think that's like one of the biggest things is sing things. Um, so singing is a big part of it. Um, memorization is a huge part of it. Like, I think you have to be away from sheets right. before you can truly put expression in something because you just, it's too many things to be thinking about otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think those would probably be my my two biggest tips. Um, but I, I it also it all comes down to like, it, it's all faces. If you're, if you're founding, again, these foundations, if your foundations aren't solid enough, mm -hmm. it's going to be really difficult for you to ever express what you want to with your music. So it's so important that you practice the foundations away from the tunes that you want to be playing them in. And then when you go to the music, that's just more second nature. Yeah, no, I agree with you. Um, I'm, I've been working on a sonata with my teacher. And as painful as it is, it is a really good foundation builder. And I have really noticed how it has helped me in mm -hmm. playing other music. So, you know, as painful as it is, it's, it's a necessity <laughs> to, yeah, to make us absolutely. a better musician, right? So I, I definitely resonate with what you said there, for sure. Uh, so what are some of the ways we can get stay in touch with what you're doing? So there's a couple of ways. Um, on I have a newsletter that's called Harp Tips Tuesday. Um, I just got mine today. Every, yeah, <laughs> so every Tuesday it goes out with something kind of harp related. So you can sign up to that through my website, which is just aileyrobertson.com. Um, also, Facebook is a good place, um, either through my actual Facebook page, um, or I've got a Facebook group um, called Harp Learners, um, which is a sort of a, a more general chat place. So that's that's a good thing. Um, I'm on Instagram and Twitter and, and all that social media stuff as well. But, but I'd say those are the main places, either through kind of the blog and my website and newsletter or Facebook. And we'll make sure we put all that information in the video description for our viewers. Thank and you. is there any exciting projects that we can expect from you in the next little while? Ooh, um, there's a few things in the works. Um, I'm putting the finishing touches at the moment to a technique book. Um, which is um, all all different technical. I, I felt that there was there's a lot of kind of these etude books and things out there, but there's nothing specifically designed for Celtic music, and um, that, right. that particularly looks at the techniques involved in in Celtic music. So that's about eighty percent of the way there at the moment. Um, hopefully, another solo album at some, some point this year. Um, oh, I really like that. Lovely. And then um, myself and Adriano, the Italian harp player, are, are working on a duo project at the moment. So. Again, hopefully there'll be something out with that soon. Fantastic. And I also want to point out that in your website, you have provided, there's a practice guide that we can purchase. It's yes. Nice. And we can print out pages and customize it into um, our little, it's a, I don't know if I'm saying it wrong, because there's also, a, there's a practice guide and then there's also a journal, right? Am I correct? In yeah. So there's a, a free practice guide, which is just like a sort of guide to effective 
practice habits. Um, right. Because again, I was aware that so many people were practicing, but not really getting the results that they wanted. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of going through like what can make your practice more um, efficient. And then tied into that, I realized that a lot, I think a lot of good um, practice forming is about really reflecting on what your goals are and setting goals and reflecting on what's working and what's not and and tracking your habits and things like that and i think that again it comes into this thing like so much of music is is mental right. so if you can really look at what's working and then you've kind of got this document of of what you've done and, and what you wanted to achieve and you can see well why am i getting this result what what led up to it whether it's good or bad what's been happening and it just allows you to be a bit more accountable to yourself for that yeah, so definitely should check those out. And I think especially for people who are looking to join your harp circle, I think it will be really good for them to keep that journal, right? Yeah, and, and talk about that, because I do that with my harp friends once in a while. And we really notice when you, you know, when you said the reflection piece is so important. Mm -hmm. um, it's one thing to just write down what you have done. But when you look back into it and kind of extract the lessons learned, I think that's really uh, key in sort of pushing it to the next level. So yeah, they, and it comes down to that thing, like it would be better to do 15 minutes of like really focused practice than an hour of unfocused practice. I like it. I, I'm, I'm definitely an efficiency kind of person because I'm wearing too many hats and I, <laughs> yeah. I, I always talk about all, how yeah. you know, it would be ideal if I have 40 hours a day so I can, you know, play hard yeah. for 10 and be a mum for another five or what you have is. But yeah, time <laughs> is a limited resource. So I agree with you, being effective and efficient is going to go a long way. So definitely, definitely. Um, we'll have to make a concerted effort in, in streamlining how I spend my time in a, yeah. in a good way. Um, well, thank you very much for spending the time with us. We're going to make Pleasure. sure to capture all the um, links that you have mentioned in the video description. And um, I'm going to have I'm going to be seeing you soon again in the workshop. So I look yes. forward to that. Yeah, looking forward to seeing you there.